several weeks, maybe several months, I don't know, on the life of David. And we're up at about the part where David uh, is dealing with the rebellion of Absalom. And David's got a mess on his hands. I think I preached last Sunday on child discipline, child training. And uh, David was a failure as a father. If you'll think about what David was dealing with right then, David was uh, dealing with, uh, he had committed adultery himself. He had a son that uh, raped a half a, a daughter. There's a half brother and sister raped her. He had a boy that killed another guy. And in this situation with Absalom, after he's driven David out of the king, out of the off of, out of Jerusalem, he goes up and spends time with David's concubines, his daddy's concubines. Now, here's what I'm getting to. David has a complete, unmigitated disaster on his hands. The nation is in disaster, but it's not hard to figure out why. Dean asked a very important question this morning. He asked about a formula. Dean, I don't know that there's a formula about raising kids, but I will say this. There's principles here. And I can look back and I can see, Reggie, God's word is always true. It was you that didn't do it. It was you that didn't really do it. Oh, you talked a good talk, Reggie, but you didn't always do what God said. And you're just reaping what you sowed. God honors his promises as been taught to the degree that we honor his commands and his precepts and his judgments. Now, again, I appreciate him saying salvation's free. But if you're going to enjoy his promises, you're going to have to obey. And you're going to have to be diligent to do it. Now, here, say, Reggie, what happened to David? David quit reading the Bible. David quit reading the law. Because the law, everything that was going on in his family was violation of the law. Everything David was doing was violation of the law. The Bible said that when you get a king... In that, for Israel, he said that king is to write out himself a copy of the law. How many has ever wrote a book out, complete book out by longhand? If you haven't done that, you ought to do it. I wrote the book of John out one time by hand. That's an experience. Pick you out a book that you like and write it out by hand. Get, go, go to town, get your loose leaf notebook, whatever you want to get, write it out by hand. It'll change you. It'll slow you down. It'll make you think you're writing those words, you're writing those phrases, and the Holy Ghost of God, and you're praying as you go, and you're asking God to show you. The God had told the king, you know what that meant? That the king was to write Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy out by hand. There was a reason for him to do that, so he would not forget the law of God. I want to say on the outset of this message today that I preach this in joy. I'm not up here hammering and up here beating nothing. I, David said he delighted in the law of the Lord. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners or so forth and the scorners and all that. But he said his delight is in the law of the Lord. You know, most Christians, when you mention law, they go, oh, we're not in the law. Oh, really? So the law doesn't apply to you and I. That's why America right now has a flood of sexual allegations against people all over this country. It's because we no longer delight in the law. And we've got this attitude toward God's law that we don't have to mind. Now, if you've been here on Wednesday nights, we've been, as far as I'm concerned, been having a blast on Wednesday nights. We said that the... Ceremonial law, God has done away with that in Christ. We don't bring lambs, we don't bring calves, we don't bring pigeons, bullocks, whatever it is, and have and, and sacrifice and have an altar here stuff. Our altar is the cross. Jesus is our lamb. It's finished and it's over with a one time forever sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Not only that, but there are dietary laws that we're not under. In the New Testament, that sheet came down in Peter's vision and Paul well, don't in Colossians, he said, You pray in the word of God, he says you can eat it. We eat bacon, amen. We, I mean, you know, we, we eat pork chops, all right? We eat shrimp. There's a lot of things. We eat, ham, we eat cheeseburgers, okay? That has been done away with. But the moral law and the criminal law has never and will never be done away with or set aside, okay? So we're going to look at Leviticus 18, 19, 20, and we're going to do an exercise this morning. But I just want to say that I rejoice in this. I'm glad for the law of God. I don't want to live under Islamic law. I don't want to live under humanistic law. I don't want to live under liberal, progressive, socialistic law. I don't want to live under communist law. I want to live under Judeo-Christian biblical law. Because there's a song we say, America, America, confirm thy liberty in law. We're only going to be a free people to the degree that we obey and submit to and adhere to God's law. Now, let me say again on the outset. Especially to some of you guys listening that think I'm a legalist. I'm not a legalist. Quit saying that. God's going to really straighten you out to judgment seat, buddy. Okay? I'm not a legalist. Never have been a legalist. Don't want to be a legalist. But I'm going to tell you something. Don't you get on to me for preaching the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Because it's all God's word. And you're supposed to preach the whole counsel of God as well. 
Now, I just want to say this to you. We are not ta- the law does not say, for the, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. Everybody on target with me this morning. We don't obey the law. Look to the law. By the way, none of us obey the law completely. Only Jesus did that. But does that mean I'm not supposed to kill, that, that I can kill people just because everybody don't obey the law? Does that mean I go out and break the law just because I don't keep it completely? No, you know better than that. So what I'm saying is this, we need to understand carefully. First of all, we're not preaching on the law of God and delighting in the law of God to be saved. We're delighting in the law of God and preaching the law of God and, and applying the law of God because we are saved. And that's all the difference in the world, okay? So let's get it down straight here this morning. Not preaching if you do these things, it'll save you. Never has, never will, and never ha- and it won't save you, okay? Now, so let's go to Leviticus chapter 18. And we're going to look, we're going to read it. I'm going to read a verse, and then you're going to read a verse all together in unison. We've got to roll and go. Are you ready? Let's go. Right, chapter 18, everybody that's there, just say amen. amen. Now, I hope you've got an old authorized version, King James Bible, in your lap. I hope you've got Jesus in your heart. And I hope, I, hope you got, I hope you got joy in your mind, all right? Now, I'm going to read a verse. You're going to read a verse. Once in a while, we may stop. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Go. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein you dwelt, shall you not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whether I bring you, shall you not do. Neither shall you walk in their ordinances. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live. Look at that. Listen, not die, but live in them. Go ahead. Verse number six. Now, wait just a minute. Hold on. Now, here's what I want to give you something. How many members in the book of 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5, the Bible said, add to your faith virtue. That is not an arbitrary statement that Peter decided to write. That was the Holy Ghost of God confirming with the Old Testament, the, the truth of the New Testament. The first, the, uh, did you know up till now in the book of Leviticus, you've been studying the offerings, which are a picture of the cross, which speaks of salvation. First part of Leviticus, faith. Next part of Leviticus, virtue, moral purity. Don't worry about becoming a theologian. Get saved and keep your britches up. Amen. You see what, what the world's sick of? They just, just a pastor out in Colorado just got caught yesterday. He's, he's now the father of a baby in the womb of a 14-year-old girl in his church. That's just yesterday. All over this country, we got faith, 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 faith. But we don't do what the Bible said. We don't add virtue. That's the very first thing that you're to add to your faith. I'm not interested in you being a big shot down at camp. I'm not being you a big shot about out witnessing. I want to tell you something. God says add to your faith virtue first. And that New Testament principle is exactly like the Old Testament because Leviticus 1 through 17 is about the blood of Christ and how it cleanses from sin and how it saves your soul. And then chapter 18 kicks in and it said, because you're saved, live right, live right, live pure, be a moral people. God is a holy God. Reflect the holiness of Almighty God in your life. Okay, here we go. Now we got all that. uh, Let's see. Verse number six. All right, now, you know what the old time preachers would have said? That means what it says, says what it means. You leave your sister alone. You leave your brother alone. That's called incest. And that's countries, this country's full of it. Rotten garbage. And you say, well, I know better than that, Reggie. Don't everybody else? And they evidently don't. Daddies ought to leave their daughters alone. Can I tell you something? You're going to think I'm crazy. I never changed one of my daughter's diapers. And that wasn't all because I don't like to change diapers. You can say, I don't care if you like that or not. I thought it was good. I never walked in. You can ask my girls. I didn't go trotting into their bedroom. Never. If I did, I, they had wide, wide open notice. Daddy's a coming. Okay? This is good old. Now, I, I love this. This is fun. Amen. This is good old cornbread, good, good cornbread and beans, fried potatoes and onions, American preaching. This is what will separate us from other nations. God said, this is what will make you different, Israel. And this is what make America different. If American people will get back and judgment must begin at the house of God. I'm not worried about what they did at the bar last night. I'm not their pastor. I wish there was. But I am concerned about what goes on in this church, okay? And what goes on in my life and what goes on in my family. All right. Verse number seven, the nakedness of thy father, the nakedness of thy mother, thou shalt not uncover. She is thy mother, thou shalt not uncover her nakedness.
the nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, or the daughter of thy mother, which shall be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness shall not cover. Now stop, if you're just taking here, we've already, we've already hit two of the problems that David's family got hit with. I don't know if you could pick that up or not. We've already popped into two of the problems in his family because they wasn't reading, they were not reading, they had forgot Leviticus, Leviticus 18, 19, and 20, and they had said, we don't care about the law of God anymore. We're going to live like, like we want to. We're going to have a society like we want to. Nobody's going to put any more restrictions train on us and already you've hit two of what hit david's family whose turn is it verse number 10 go ahead verse number 11 the nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter begotten of thy father she's thy sister thou shalt not uncover her nakedness Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sisters, for she is thy mother's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter in law, she is thy son's wife. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter, neither shalt thou take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness, for they are her near kinswoman, it is wickedness. Also thou shalt not approach unto a woman to uncover nakedness, as long as she is put apart for uncleanness. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Moloch. Now, if you were here Wednesday night, I'm not going to talk about it this morning, but if you've been here Wednesday night, you'd know what we're talking about here. This is a bad business. There's still a Moloch out here in this country. This stuff is still going on today. Satan, Satan is behind Moloch, and it's still happening today. Go ahead. Uh, who was, it? Who, was I reading or you reading? Thou shalt not profane the name of the Lord thy God. I am the Lord. Verse 22, go ahead. Neither shall thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before beast and lie down there too. It is confusion. Watch this now. And the land is defiled. Therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it. And the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. For all these abominations will have the men. Now here's what was going on. For all these abominations have the men of the land done which were before you and the land is defiled. This is what I'm afraid for America. I'm not worried about pollution. I'm not worried about a gas spill. I'm not worried about carbon footprints. I'm not worried about global warming. I'm worried about this country getting so nasty, filthy, rotten, low down, nasty, filthy, perverted that God make this land vomit us out. Verse number 28, go ahead. Whosoever should commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them, shall be cut off among their people. I want you to flip to page number 20. We're going to chapter 20. We're going to do chapter 20 reading. And now I'm going to take off reading here. And then we're going to back to chapter 19. We're just going to do a lot of reading today and just let God say, now I want to say this to the parents in here. We're reading some pretty tough stuff. Uh, if your children have questions, you, you talk to them, you mom and daddies, okay? I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about stuff. God's word says what it was, but I will tell you this. This is God's word. We don't need to avoid it. In fact, it looks to me like we better be getting back to it. Verse number 20, I'm going to just read myself. Here we go. The Lord spake unto Moses. Chapter 20, everybody there say amen. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or the strangers that sojourn in Israel, who give any of his seed into Moloch, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I'll set my face against that man, cut him off from among his people, because he hath given of his seed to Molech, to defile my sanctuary, and to profane my, profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do anyway hide their eyes from the man who giveth any of his seed to Molech, and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and his family and cut him off and all that go to whoring after him to commit whoredom with Molech from among their people. Now, verse number one through five was about Moloch. And I want to tell you something. The spirit of Moloch is the spirit that uh, we have in America that's doing the abortions across America. Same spirit. It's killed the babies. 
but particularly Moloch, one of the firstborn. Most abortions are firstborns. All right, now let's go. And again, Wednesday night we was on that verse number six. Everybody, listen up. You kids, pay real attention to your preacher here. And the soul that turneth after such a have familiar spirit. That's that's when your grandpa had a devil in him, or your grandma had a devil in her, and she died, and that devil jumped out of her dead body and moved into your body. And I want to tell you something about the familiar spirits. They'll know stuff that you you wouldn't know. You, no way in the world you'd know it because they lived in bodies before you. This is dangerous stuff. It's a mess. It's wickedness. You stay away from anything demonic. Now look at the next thing, wizards. I'm talking about Harry Potter junk. Some of you mom and dads ain't got no more sense than let your kids watch this junky stuff that's all over these social media stuff. And might about look to me like about for my taste of it, I don't have to see a bunch of stuff. If my spirit goes woo, 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 starts flashing red light, I don't care what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing. If my spirit goes, starts flashing red light, I say don't do it. Now listen, Harry Potter ought not be in your house. Nothing else ought to be in your house of wizards and witches and familiar spirits and all that stuff. Now look at verse number 17. What in the seven? He said, sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy. Sanctification means you're going to be different than the rest of the world. You're not going to be like the Egyptians. You're not going to be like the Canaanites. You're going to be a different world. Sanctification is a good Bible word. And we ought to be sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Uh, apart from the world, unto Jesus Christ. Well, live different. Our marriages ought to be different. Our families ought to be different. Our homes ought to be different. Our church ought to be different. Our education ought to be different. Our businesses ought to be different. They ought to be run according to the, God, to the word of the Lord. Now he said in verse number eight, and you shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. Now here are some of his statutes. He said, everyone that curseth his father's mother shall surely be put to death. You kids, I'll tell you right now, you're to honor your father and your mother. The Bible said that in Exodus. And I'll tell you what, you ought to not talk back. When your, when your mama says shut up, you're going to shut up. I seen something the other day, there'd be six or seven old, I mean, uh, old godly dressed black women. And, and this old boy said, this here was the law back when I was a kid. <laughs> Amen. He said, they didn't mess with you. And it didn't matter if you was their kid. If, if, if you was in their church and you messed up, one of them mammies would slap you sideways. And the other mammy would walk over and say, thank you for taking care of my child while I was gone. Yep. Nowadays, they get, well, gonna sue, they'll sue you. Get mad at you. Uh, he, said, you don't, he said, you don't curse your father and mother. You kids, listen to me. You may not like, you may go through some tough times, but whatever you do, you remember what your preacher's preaching. Because in a few years, I'm going to stand before God's almighty judgment bar and I will testify against you. God's going to say, Reggie, did you preach that? I'll say, yes, Lord, I preached it. Well, he was a sitting there and he didn't pay no attention to you, did he? Verse, he said he cursed his father and mother. His blood shall be upon him. Now I want you to watch. There's a progressional sequence here. Verse 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer, the adulterer, the adulterer, the adulterer, and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. That's why Jesus didn't let him stone that woman. He didn't never say, not, he didn't tell him not to stone her. He, sa- he, did, he said, if you're without sin, you cast the first stone. And the other problem was they didn't have the adulterer. They didn't have the guy with her. They were violating the law and killing her. They weren't following the law. They were perverting the law. Now, verse number, so God says you don't commit adultery. Keep your hands off other people's wives. Keep your eyes off other men's wives. Somebody ought to jump up and say, hallelujah. Got a preacher preaching the book this morning. That's right. Amen. Well, how many of you guys, well, some of you guys are so perver- perverted. You like other men to look at your wife with lust. Is that, you're a pervert. Anyway, boy, I feel good this morning. I feel like we got the devil on the run. I feel like he's mad and I'm glad. Amen. Verse number 11. And the man that lieth with his father's wife uncovered his father's nakedness, both of them should surely be put to death. Their blood should be, I was like, good, land of living. How stupid crazy can a guy get? But they was a doing that garbage. And can I tell you something? We're headed that direction in this country. Look at this here in verse number, verse number 12. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them should surely be put to death and have wrought confusion. Their blood should be upon them. Amen, amen. Verse 13, if a man lie with mankind as lieth with woman, both of them shall have committed abomination. That's sodomites. God said they should surely be put to death. Their blood should be upon them. Verse number 14, if a man take a wife and a mother, it's wickedness. They should be burnt with fire, both he and they, and they should be no wickedness among you. And verse 15, if a man lie with a beast, he should surely be put to death. We're headed that direction in this country. And shall slay the beast. If a woman approach unto any beast, lie down there too. Thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. Thou shalt surely be, they should surely be put to death. Their blood should be upon them. Now I'm going to give you a sequence here. It started out with, here's how it started. It started off with kids cussing their mom and dad. Up there in the top of the, verse number 10. Verse number, yeah, verse number, verse number nine. Now you watch this. Started off with kids being disrespectful, dishonoring, cussing their mom and dad. You get a society cussing mom and dad, you got big troubles coming down the pike. 
Then you move to adultery, just old plain, simple cornbread country, country adultery, all right? Then it moves down to some perversion, some stupid stuff, inner family stupid stuff. And then it moves to, down to sodomy. Then it moves to bestiality. There's a progression. Now listen to me. How many of those sins did God say they ought to be put to death for? All of them. Now here's, wh- here's why we're losing the fight on the issue of sodomy in this country. We'll jump up and down and say, I'll tell you these sodomites, that nasty stinking bunch of stuff. And it is. And we say it's perversion. And it is. But you see, they'll, they'll just quietly take you and say, well, open up your little Bible. You're a Christian. You, you believe the Bible, don't you, big fundamental Christian? You'll say, yeah, yeah. They'll open up your Bible and say, well, you committed adultery. You, you, you ain't even living with the first wife you had. Oh, and that's supposed to be okay. Are you listening to me? We're going to lose this battle in this country until we get back the Bible. Do you say, Reggie, ain't there forgiveness? Sure, there's forgiveness. And thank God there is. And I'm not up here to try to do this. I'm just telling you something. We'll jump up and down and say, boy, that will not be Solomon. But somehow or another, we're not quite so bad with fornication. That's not quite as bad. I mean, you know, somebody goes out and commits fornication. Yeah, it's bad and we hate it and everything. But, you know, we don't have the same attitude toward that as we do Solomon. Yet your Bible says that. See, we've cut the scripture right down. We, we jumped down to verse number 13 down there where the queers is at. Now, ah, that, that's bad. But all over America, you just, you know, you can be an adulterer and chase women and live like a dog. and It's all right. Ain't near as bad, is it? Come on. Ain't near as bad, is it? And do you know really and truthfully in my mind, it ain't as bad. I mean, somehow or another, I can, I can kind of stand, uh, you know, somebody, you know, marrying somebody else. Well, I, I'm not for it, but I mean, I can kind of live with that a little bit. But a queer eyes, can't, I, can't, I can't buy that. But the funny thing about it is the book says there's all guilty of death. So what we've done, we've lost the argument because we're picking and choosing the scriptures we want. Uh, this gets into all kinds of stuff. Rape is the death penalty for rape. Now I'm going to throw you a curveball real quick. David committed adultery. He p- piddled around for a year, wouldn't deal with it. God sent Nathan to him. Nathan, and then David said, I have sinned. And he said, you're not going to die. You better thank God for mercy. You better thank God for mercy. Truth about us is, if all of us in this church house that's ever committed adultery, either physically or in our mind, was going to face the death penalty, there wouldn't be enough gallows in Norwood to hang us all. But I'm going to tell you something. God has shown this old preacher, Reggie, until you get back to my book and quit selectively, selectively picking out the sins that you think are worse than the rest of them. Because you didn't get to a sodomite generation in America accidentally. Back in the 40s, about World War II, when all the boys started going off to war, the girls and the boys were fornicating like nobody's business. Okay? They come back from World War II. They had been subjected to all kinds of cultures around the world, unbiblical Judeo, un, un, Judeo-Christian cultures. Come up through the 50s, started rock and roll. When you got into the 60s, the Beatles came over. Free sex society came in. The colleges started teaching everything's all right. And, and Woodstock and all that other junk came on and all your rock and roll music. And everybody threw the old standard bearer off. And us preachers, you know what? Our church has got full of people committing adultery. So we quit preaching on adultery. You would not believe how I've been attacked as a preacher. One of the biggest things ever happened to me, I mean, other preachers jumping on me because I preached. I would preach, say, you don't know anything about the gospel, Kelly. If you couldn't preach on adultery and fornication, you wouldn't have anything to preach on. And I've said, if somebody's not preaching on it. Now, you listen to me. I'm for forgiveness. I thank God for forgiveness. I have sinned. I have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay, I have had to have the blood of Christ applied to my heart. And I thank God for it. But you listen to me, that don't make it right. That don't make it so it's okay to get up there and be silent about it. Now, I'm going to tell you kids something in this church. If you want to stop the downhill slide of this nation, you be moral. You add virtue to your faith. Okay? Now, verse number 17 says, If a man take his sister as his father's daughter, his mother's daughter, see her nakedness and see it. Hang on just a minute. I want some man in this church to define nakedness to me. Maybe I ought to have a grandma in here to define nakedness. Sister Jean, what's nakedness? Anything that ain't covered. Thank you. Isn't it a shame we're going to have to go back to a previous generation to to find out what nakedness is? Because somehow or another, the girls of this generation and women, they, they don't know. Or if they know, they're being very rebellious against God. I want to tell you, I'm telling you right now, if your riches, first of all, you ought not... If, you, if, you're going, if you're going to go pick blackberries in a blackberry, a copperhead infested blackberry patch, please wear some britches. 
Now, maybe you don't have to, but do something to make sure, you know, I'm not saying you've got to get out in the briar patch with a dress on. But I am telling you this, when you're out among people, you need, be, you need to have clothes on that are becoming of a woman. And the Bible speaks of modesty. How come there's such a rebellion? I mean, can I please tell you, mamas, you young ladies, do not expect the sodomite situation to improve in this country as long as the women of this country are going to dress immodestly. And as long as the young men are going to be a bunch of whoremongers thinking that their whole life's goal is to chase women. I mean, we're so messed up in this country, it ain't even funny. I'm telling you, we are messed up. And there's the holy God in heaven who's getting a hold of this old preacher's heart and saying, Hey, Reggie, truth about this, you've been preaching about half cock. I just, I mean, I'm telling you, right here, where did it go to? Right here, I just wrote a brand new message th- this morning on half cock Christianity. Did you know there's nothing more dangerous than a gun half cocked? How would you like me to be up here with an old 30 30? And I said, hey, man, po- How many's ever tried to teach a kid how to cock a gun? And they, you know what they'll do, don't you? They'll go, pop, bang. You'll go, no, no, easy, easy. Hang on to it. Hang on to it. It is dangerous to be half cocked. I ain't preaching it now, but I will. <laughs> the problem is that we're half cocked. We're obeying half of it and the other half we're not. We're saying some of it's okay just by our silence. Anyway, my, 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 I'm having a good time. All right. So we got into there that chapter 20 and. He, verse number 18, if a man lieth a woman have a sickness, verse 19, thou shalt not uncover the neck of thy mother's sister, verse 20, thou shalt not, if a man lieth his uncle's wife, so forth, all this stuff. Look at verse 22. You shall therefore keep all my judgments, all my ju- uh, statutes and judgments, do them that the land, whether I bring you to dwell in, spew you not out. And you shall not walk in the manner of the nation which I cast up before you, for they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. But I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land. I will give it to you and possess it, a land that floweth milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which has separated you from other people. Ye shall therefore put difference between clean beast and unclean, between unclean fowls and clean, and ye shall not make your souls abominable by beast, or not fowl, or any man or living thing creepeth on the ground, and so forth. Verse 26, you should be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have severed you from other people, that you should be mine. A man that hath, man or woman or a man or woman that hath a familiar spirit, verse 27, or that is a wizard, shall surely be put to death. They shall stone him with stones, their blood shall be upon him. Now, I'm, I want to tell you why. I will give you a little something this morning that you people need to hear. I'm thankful you're here, okay? I thank God for you. I love you. But you, you know I'm telling you the truth. I got more people than a jackrabbit that listens to me on Facebook, but they wouldn't come to this church. if it's, you, you couldn't drag them to this church with a chainsaw, with a, with a, with a log chain. You know why? Because they do not want to be identified with this church. And some of you are struggling about the reproach of Christ. And that's what people have struggled here with. Because you're not sure you want somebody to say, where do you go to church at? Uh, 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 Oh, down there where Reg Kelly preaches? They make you out like you're some kind of a cult. You know, I'm going to tell you something right now. This is no cult. We preach salvation by grace, by by faith, the grace of God, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, believe in the death, blood, and resurrection. I'm telling you, I believe in creation. Believe that or not. I believe the Bible is the word of God. Don't have any mistakes in it. I don't believe you're saved by works, you're saved by faith. Are we a cult? No, we're not a cult. You know what the real problem is? We're, we believe the Bible. That's the problem. We believe the Bible. And now in America, if you believe the Bible and preach the Bible, you're considered to be some bunch of weirdos. Get up and preach. You ought to have all the kids God wants you to give. Oh, oh he's a weirdo. Wow, we don't have a bunch of kids up there. Believe you ought to dress modestly. Why are a bunch of freaks up there? Believe you ought to wear dresses. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Women dressing like men will be as wrong as it is just for men. If I start wearing a dress up here, you wouldn't like that. So if it's wrong for me to wear a dress, it's wrong, if it's wrong for me to look like a woman in a dress, it's wrong for you to look like a man. And the same, watch this. We'll go over at the queers and say, that's an abomination. Guess what? God says, if you dress, we well, put on women's garb, Reggie, you're an abomination. Woman puts on man's garb, he's an abomination. Same book. You see, what we're doing, we're selectively picking the passage of scripture that we want, that fits what we've decided, our little, our little view of Christianity and, and we're going to be. And then the rest of it, we've redefined all that, or we're at least totally silent about it. That's just the way it is. Now, let's really have some fun. We're preaching on the law of God. Chapter 19. Chapter 19. Now, we, we've done chapter 18, chapter 19. Now, here, I'm up here to provoke you. Now, I realize, I'm like an old boy said one time, he said, Reggie, I'd come here, I'd come church down there, but you just kind of got an edge to your preaching. That's good, because a, a sword has an edge. A sword has an edge, amen. And so, if I'm preaching the book, the sword of the Spirit is going to have an edge. might have two on them, so we cut them both way, all right? I want to tell you something. I will die an old time hellfire brimstone, Christ exalting, cross bearing. I mean, Jesus honoring preacher. And I'm going to holler and shout and I ain't going to be quiet about it. 
That's just the way it is. All right, now let's look at verse number 19. We're fixing to have some fun and delight in the law of the Lord. Oh, my goodness. Got all kinds of time to preach here. Verse number one, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speak unto the children of Israel, congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, be ye holy, ye shall be holy, for I am the Lord your God. Now, what I want to challenge you to do is go home, read Leviticus 18, 19, 20, and all this other stuff. And we, oh, man alive, you want to have fun, go to Deuteronomy and all that kind of stuff. By the way, our forefathers studied the book of Deuteronomy when they wrote the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. But you circle that little phrase, I am the Lord your God. He keeps telling them, I am the Lord your God. Be, I'm holy. He said, be holy. Now, verse number three, you shall fear every man, his mother and his father. <laughs> I like that. Oh, I'm going to be your little buddy. We're going to go fishing together. We're going to be buddies. Why don't you be a daddy? Why don't you be a mama? Yeah, take them fishing. Yeah, I'll be a buddy. But be more than that. They got, you're, the only, you're the only hope they got to have a daddy. All right. This book says... Your kids are to fear you. Now, I want to ask you a question. Does your kids fear you? I can, I can find it out real quick. How many times do you have to tell them to be quiet? I, I, I'm just telling you. Oh, my. <laughs> I never will forget. I never will forget. Uh, me and Karen hadn't been married but about two years. And we had a preacher down there. And he was a struggling, but he was trying to do the best he could. Now, we had preachers come in and out every year or two or three because we'd run them off if we didn't like what they preached. Oh, we didn't really run them off, but we made them know they weren't welcome around there, Terry. <laughs> oh, we're having a good time today. All right. <laughs> and I mean, one Sunday night, I come into church, Brother Lane. I flop myself down about right in here somewhere at the edge of the seat. And I think Karen was sitting right there. And boy, I'm, I don't know what happened to that guy. All of a sudden, he just got up and started preaching on every sin that was in the church. And I tell you what, of course, I was a hypocrite, lost hypocrite. I was a lost hypocrite. Oh, I go to church. I did it all. I sung specials. I, I, got, I knew how to do that stuff. When you go to church 13 years in a row when you're a kid, you know it all. But I was sitting there, and I mean, all of a sudden, Brother Randy, he started plowing everybody's ground up. Of course, he was hitting me about it three licks out of four. And I'm telling you what, I went. <laughs> <laughs> I swolled up like a bull, bullfrog. <laughs> I think I've reaped what I sowed. I think the Lord sent in a few Dean every once in a while to do that to me just because you always reap more than you sowed. That's the only time I ever really remember getting mad at the preacher. Boy, I got mad at him. I thought, who's he think he is? Boy, I mean, he was just, he was just peeling the covers back. He pulling the, he pulling the refrigerator out. He pulling the wash machine out and all that garbage behind all of our whitey sepulchers. Woo! Now I'm going to tell you a little something. God used that message on a Sunday night to expose my hypocrisy and my ungenuineness. And I'll tell you something, even though I got mad at him, God used that to break me later on down the road of life. God let me know. He said, don't tell you something. You can play church all you want to all your life. You're going to wind up in hell. Now, look at verse number 19. Now, this is this. You know, if I went to if I went to Ghana, maybe the Congo sister and some old dude come out there with no shirt on. And big old lobes pulled his ears down like that and had great big old deals. And he had a bunch of nose rings in his nose. And he's all painted up and his hair cut funny. And he had on a loincloth. I think this is Africa. This is the way they do. They don't know any different. But when I walk into the battlefield mall. <laughs> and when I see it, I'm wondering, am I in the right country? Now, you listen, here we go. He said in verse number, he said, you fear your mom and daddy. You keep my Sabbath. I want to tell you something. You, I still, I believe that. I do. I believe we ought to honor God with the rest day. All right. And by the way, it's plural. It's S. It's not just what some folks think Saturday is. Now, verse number four, turn you not into idols, nor make yourselves molten gods. I am Lord your God. If you're any Catholics in here, quit, quit bowing down to Mary and get rid of them Mary statues. Amen. Amen. And Uncle Joe. All that stuff, I don't know. Verse number five, and if you offer a sacrifice, a peace offering the Lord, you shall offer it at your own will. Amen. God don't force people to worship him. God says it's going to have to be coming from your heart. Verse number six, it shall be eaten the same day you offered it on the morrow. And if all of it remains the third day, it shall be burnt in the fire. I said Wednesday night, Sunday morning, I was going to tell you about leftovers from Thanksgiving. Right there is the leftover principle. After three days, throw it away. And there it is. You say, we got refrigerators. Well, it still don't it ain't that good after that long. Hey, mommy, some of you ladies have got 47 Tupperware pieces in your refrigerator. Get them. Some of them got mold that thick on the backside of your refrigerator. Get them out of there. Hey, Amen. Boy, that didn't bring much joy, did it? 
It just says, <laughs> if it remains a third day, burn it with fire. Why would God tell you that? Because there's going to be some little bugs start multiplying in there. By the way, let me just throw this in while we're having such a good time. That has to do with what Americans call shelf life. That's teaching you to eat fresh foods. Oh, oh, well, T. Hopper one time was, I was over at his house and he pulled out a can of green beans. And he said, Reggie, I've been reading the label. He said, I can't pronounce several of these name, words on it. He said, I don't think it'd be good for man to eat stuff he can't pronounce the words on. I remember that just as clear as a bell. Shelf life. There's something there. Do you good and meditate on it. Um, verse number seven. And if it be eaten at all on the third day, it's abominable. <laughs> It shall not be accepted. Verse 8, therefore, everyone that eateth it shall bear his iniquity because he hath profaned the hallowed thing of the Lord. The soul shall be called from the people. God don't want you to die of tomaine poisoning. That's what. <laughs> Verse number 9. Here we go. God's welfare program. You ready? When you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of the harvest. Go to the book of Ruth. God had a poverty program, a welfare program, where you could go out and, and gather up your own grain and your own food. You didn't go down there with a set of stamps and this, that, and the other and stuff and so forth. And somebody handed it to you for doing nothing. Amen. Oh, we're having a good time. Say amen right there, everybody. Amen. Everybody say amen. If you don't want to be dependent on the government, you'd rather depend on God. Say amen. amen. Hey, you folks listening online, if you don't like that, go listen to Joe Osteen. Amen. Is he not on anymore? Oh, my. <laughs> okay. Now, let me tell you what that means. That means that you might have a calf. You might have plenty of calves this year. It might mean you ought to give one of your calves to somebody that needs it. It might mean you ought to have it butchered and say, hey, I'm going to give it. It might mean that you have it butchered and have it processed and you bring it up here and say, Brother Danny or Brother Lakey, listen, I want you to take this. Would you take that box over to, to so-and-so's house and don't you dare tell them who sent it to them. It means that you just don't try to get every dime out of everything God's, God, made the, God made the garden grow. It means you might have some corn and some green beans. And you might have some stuff that God's given you a surplus on. And God is saying give that to some of those people. There's a million applications to that verse. But what God is saying is, but don't take away people's dignity of work. It may mean some old boy in here is out of a job. And you've got some wood needs to be cut. You might, he might, instead of giving him the wood, say, listen, come out to our place. He say, I ain't got a chainsaw. You say, I'll get you one. He say, I ain't got a split maw. I'll get you one. But go down there and cut wood. And we'll sell it. You can buy groceries for your family. I don't, I, I could preach all day, give illustrations how this works, but meditate upon it. Now, he said, verse 10, thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape. Can you see some old stingy, greedy old guy? Hey, there's a grape over there you missed. Get that grape. God says, leave that stuff on there for the poor to come through your vineyard and eat. Let that lady, I never will forget, Karen and I have been married for a long time. How many has ever planted uh, squash? <laughs> Boy, me and Karen had our, we was a young married couple, we were going to garden. And we planted two rows. <laughs> squash. <laughs> man, oh man, that squash are going everywhere. That squash are going everywhere. And green beans and stuff. And I remember one time, a lady, you know, those kinds of couple going through a pretty hard times. She found out we had garden stuff and she wanted to know if she'd come up and she'd come and picked it herself. And she fixed it herself. We didn't do nothing. She just came and picked it, you know. And that's what God wants us to do. God wants us to be Christians. God wants us to help people. He said, He blessed. If you have pity on the poor, and He said, You consider the poor. Now, He said there in verse number 11, You shall not steal. Oh, shucks. Neither deal falsely. <laughs> How is that old tractor, Reg? Oh, it's a good one. And you know that <laughs> you know you know there's two or three things on fixing to roll and go. <laughs> Neither lie one to another. That's the best message I ever heard, Brother Reg. <laughs> I don't know why I'm so hungry today. God don't want us stealing. There's a lot of ways to steal. There's a lady in this church this morning that she had the money people owed her. She'd buy her the best four-wheel drive ton pickup truck in this country and have a hay bed put on it and, every, and, and, and two thousand dollars worth of lights put on it. Ain't that right, Dolores? Now you listen to this preacher this morning. I'm sick of it. Can I ask you how many, how, how, how much, what do they call the accounts receivable? Do you have when you when that tire tire shop shut down? Way up there, though, wasn't it? We're talking about way up there. You know what I'm talking about this morning? Guys walked in, bought a set of tires. I'll send you a check next week. 
Check didn't come. Check didn't come. Check didn't come. Had a tire fixed. I ain't got my checkbook with me. I, 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 I don't know what it is. My bill fold. I'll be back, Dolores. I'll pay that. And after 10 years, 15 years, all that stuff gathers up. My father-in-law had a, 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 a hardware store, Mount Grove, right, years ago when I met her. He said, I'm going to have a sale. This after we'd been married several years. He said, Reg, come up here on a list sale. We was getting everything listed. And he went in there to the office and had one of the great big old wooden desks. He pulled big old center drawer out of that desk. It's chock full of rubber banded tickets. I said, Jim, what's that? He said, Reg, that's people that ain't never paid their bill. I, folks, I wouldn't have had no idea. I'm talking about thousands of them. I said, Jim, what you? He said, how'd you survive in business? Listen to what he said. This is biblical, by the way. He said, Reggie, the man, the honest man always pays a crooked man bill. Did you know you just heard the gospel? The honest man, Christ, always paid the crooked man's bill. And he said this. He said, I always had to build in to my next year's prices all the bills people wouldn't pay. So every time you don't pay your bill, Christian, every time you don't pay for that tire being fixed or for that little piece of lumber that you charged and never did go back and pay for or that lawnmower repair that you never paid for, you're making somebody else pay for it and you're a sinking thief. That's good preaching, and I don't care if I am doing it, because you know why it's good preaching? It's what the Bible says. What the Bible says. What did I do with my glasses? Anybody know what I did with my glasses? All right. Let's keep having more fun. This is more fun. <clears throat> All right. He said there in verse 12, you shall not swear by my name falsely. That means what it says. Neither shalt thou profane the name of the Lord of, of thy God. I am the Lord. Don't be using God's name lightly. I'm going to tell you something I don't like. And that's on this text and business and OMG. That's using the name of God profanely. Thank you. Don't do that. That's violating God's word. He's holy. He's God Almighty. He ain't your little idol sitting out there. Well, verse number 13. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor. In that context, that means a cheating. Nor rob him. The wages of him that's hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. Let me tell you some of you little punk something. That's piddling with drugs. By the way, I'm, I'm going to make you mad this morning. You little punk. You ain't no man. You smoking dope. You using drugs. You ain't no man. And you ain't no woman. But I'll tell you where you're headed. This past week, I had a chain, steel chainsaw, far as I know, it was stolen right out of my shop. You know what I figured happened to it? It got sold to buy somebody's drugs. And the reason we got thieves all over this country is because they're, sub, they're stealing stuff from people to buy their stupid drugs. We got, I, I, know, of, I know of kids right now who are in, Drug rehabilitation, that's a joke. Who used to go to this church? I tell you what, I preach my guts out. I preach my guts out. And you kids will go out and buy them drugs and do drugs. And your mom and daddy loved God and tried to raise you different. That, somebody ought to whip the fire out of you. Verse number 14, thou shalt not curse the deaf. Boy, that'd, be, that'd take a real man, wouldn't it? But let me give you another application of that. You cussing somebody ain't within earshot of you. You're talking about them behind their back. Or you know they ain't going to hear you. Nor put a stumbling block before the blind. I mean, how low could you be to come up here and put a, put a stumbling block in front of a blind man going down the road? But we do that because there's people out here that are blind to the gospel. And we'll cheat them. You know what he's talking about here? You don't lie to people. You don't deal falsely. You pay your bills because you're going to put a stumbling block in the front of a blind man that's lost. And he will say, if that's Christianity, I don't want anything to do with it. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my faith. And turn from their wicked ways. Then will I heal this land. Washington. God never said, if Washington will turn. If conservatives will get elected, I'll heal the land. It's when God's people quits chasing women. <laughs> start doing right. He said, thou, he said, thou shalt fear God. I'm the Lord. Why, what's he talking about? He said, God says, I'm a watching. That's why you ain't getting by with it. Verse number 15. You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor. No honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness thou shalt judge thy neighbor. God knows we've got a tendency to do that. Sometimes we, we're a mercy, we have the gift of mercy, and we'll take up for a poor person even though they were wrong. And sometimes we have respect to the rich, and we'll respect them and, and favor toward them when we know better. Even if, even, and, and act like they're not guilty when they are. Verse number 16, thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. Lord, have mercy. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. That means you don't, you don't be a tellbearer. You don't tell stuff you don't know. You're not sure about. Verse number 13, thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Underline that. You don't hate your brother in your heart. God knows that's where most of the hating's going on. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor, not suffer sin on him. You know what? The, the wounds of a friend are better than the kisses of an enemy. 
And the rebuke enters into the heart of a wise man more than a hundred stripes in the back of a fool. And God says to tell you what, if you've got a problem with your neighbor, why don't you have, be man enough and go over to him and say, listen, I don't like this. This isn't right. And I want to get this thing settled. And I'm not going to go around talking behind your back about it. Yes, sir. Thank you, Brother Terry. Oh, verse 17, thou shalt not hate that. Verse number 18, thou shalt not avenge. Let God have it. Neither bear grudge against children of thy people. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I'm a sinner. Whew. I love the law of God. Let me tell you why I love the law of God. Number one, it tells me how holy my God is. Number two, it shows me how wicked I am and it makes me know I need a savior. Because I ain't never loved my neighbors myself. Verse number 19, you should keep my statutes. Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a diverse kind. Now that rabbit will run. That rabbit will run real hard. Be ye not unequally yoked, the Bible says. Hmm. God told them people, he said, you go in that land. He said, he told, and Solomon did this very thing. David did this very thing. He said, you go in that land, don't you be marrying and mixing with them heathen. He said, I'll bring you down. And they did. You know what a, you get with a donkey and a horse? Anybody know what you get? You get a mule. Everybody know that a mule can't breed and a mule can't reproduce. Yeah, I'll let you run with that one. Verse, the next thing says, thou shall not sow thy seed with mingled seed. Wonder why? You say, well, I don't know. And I'm not sure either, but I know God knows. God said, don't do it. Neither shall a garment mingled of linen and wool come upon thee. Why? I don't know. God knows. Maybe you know. I don't know. God said, don't do it. Just don't do it. Verse number 20. Whosoever lieth carnally with a woman that is a bondmaid, betrothed to an husband, and not at all redeemed, nor freedom given to her, she shall be scourged, but they shall not be put to death, because she was not free. And he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord unto the door of the tabernacle, of the congregation of a ram for a trespass offering. Now, we'll get into some of that a little later. There's Deuteronomy has a lot to say about that stuff. We'll get that later. Verse 22, And the priest shall make an atonement for him with the ram, the trespass offering before the Lord, for a sin which he hath done, the sins he hath done shall be forgiven him. Verse 23, And when you shall come in the land, and shall have planted all manner of trees for food, then you shall count the fruit thereof as uncircumcised. Three years it shall be uncircumcised to you. It shall not be eaten of. But in the fourth year, all the fruit thereof you shall be holy to praise the Lord with. So three years you don't eat it. Fourth year you give it all to God. Fifth year... <laughs> And in the fifth year shall you eat the fruit thereof, that it may yield unto the increase thereof. I am Lord your God. You say, why did God do that? Don't know, but I guarantee you there's a good reason for it. There's several reasons, spiritual reasons, physical reasons. Verse number 26, you shall not eat anything with the blood. Neither shall you use enchantment, luck, magic, charms. Oh, St. Joseph, bless me. Mm. Nor observe times. Shouldn't have birthdays. <laughs> Come on, laugh a little bit. Let's have a good time. Hey. Jehovah Witnesses, do you know Jehovah Witnesses take that and say he shouldn't have served, served birthdays? But I don't think that's what it's talking about at all. At all. What I think it's talking about is you're going to watch the moon. You're going to, you're going to observe times and the stars. And you're going to do everything by the, by the, what do you call it, horoscope. You're messing with the wrong deal right there. All right, now, verse number 27. You shall not, uh, now, this is, where I, this is where it's going to get good. You shall not round the corners of your heads. Neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. You shall not make any, now listen to this, any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I'm the Lord. You say, Ray, what are you talking about? Well, I've been noticing that boys get these wild haircuts. You say, how does this apply today? I went and got me a haircut the other day, and I told her I wanted my money's worth, and I mean, I got it. <laughs> Boy, I mean, I had, whoa, whoa, ain't going to be nothing left. But now, if I come in here next Sunday, and I've got this all shaved out, and I've got this spiked up, how many think it might be something, something going on with Reggie? Now, here's the real deal. Here's what God's telling you. Don't you ever forget what I'm getting ready to preach. God made you, created you. He wants you to be happy with who you are. He doesn't want you falling into the trap of following every fashion and, and, and appearance fad there is in the world. He just wants you to be content with who you are. So he's telling you, you don't have to make funny. I mean, they're, they're making beards that are going yeah, like that and yeah, like that. And all and just, just whatever it takes to get people to look at me. All right. And that's just the way. And God says, don't do that stuff. Now, there was some heathenistic witchcraft kind of stuff going on here for the dead. All right, the phrase there. But here's the thing I'd get across to. I want to tell you something. Uh, I don't like lip rings. I don't like nose rings. I don't know. You know, I, I don't like cutting your body up. I don't, I don't like it. You can get mad at me if you want to. I don't like piercings. Where are you going to stop? I mean, if I come in here next week and said, well, I've got a nose ring. And you know, I wonder how proud my boys would be of I me. Mean, Dad come with a nose ring. And I say to them, don't bug me. I do what I want to do. You, I'll run my life. You run yours. I'll tell you what I bet you. They'd dread me coming to earth. Well, is this your dad? Yeah. Terry, I have lying earrings all up the side of my one of my ears, you know. Have a spider tattooed on my neck. Uh, maybe not come up here to see you. Where's your daddy at? That's him. Did you know there's not a soul in San Francisco knows, but knows that's not appropriate for a man of God. And I don't care if they've never been to church. 
<clears throat> now I'm going I'm to get close to your house now, nor print any marks upon you. Biggest fad in America right now is tattoos. Now you listen to me. There's a lot of men come out of World War II with tattoos on, all right? And then especially the Navy. And, uh, you know, it, you, you get these fads going, you get this stuff going. And if you've got a tattoo, I'm not up here beating you over the head, all right? I'm not doing it. But if you don't, if you don't have one, or you, why don't we just stop today and not get any more? Why don't we, why don't we just stop there and not get, why don't we, do, why don't we not print any more on our bodies like the Bible says? Now, how many of you kids heard, my, heard, heard, heard you preach today? The Bible said, right there, you read it, that you're not supposed to put prints on your body. How many of you read that? How many of you heard that? How you got it? All right, so when you walk in that tattoo parlor, you just remember old preacher Reg, that old sorry low down billy goat that you didn't like to go to church and listen to preach. That old guy, everything was wrong. Everything you did was wrong. <laughs> but here's what you're going to have to get. It wasn't Reggie said it. It's in your Bible. Now, I'm going to say something to you again. You got a tattoo? I, I don't care. It's, it, that's past. Over with. Out of here. All right, but let's. Why don't we just, from this day forward, do what the Bible says? I want to ask you a question: How many churches you go to and they preach on tattoos? There'll be a whole section empty next Sunday, won't there? Yeah, there you go. Verse twenty-nine. Now listen to this really good. Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the lamb fall to whoredom and the lamb become full of wickedness. I see some dads and bless God, I never would do that. Yeah, but you have your daughter over there doing cheerleading. You'll have your daughter over in the pom pom cr- crew. You let your daughter put pictures on Facebook, ought not nobody in the world see but her husband. You let her buy clothes and look and look like a prostitute. You will buy her a dress, and she's three years old, right right up to her rear end, and get her used to wearing stuff like that. And everybody going, "Oh, that's such a pretty dress, isn't she cute?" Now I'm gonna tell you something. That three year old girl's not stupid, and she's a, she learned right then. If you're gonna get the attention of people and the admiration and praise of people, you've got to dress half naked. So the rest of her life, she's gonna dress half naked. This old book's got it. I'll tell you right now, we're going to have tough enough time keeping things in order, not doing that junk. Verse 30, you should keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. What? Reverence my sanctuary. This ain't romper room. This ain't romper room. This place set aside to worship God. I want everybody to have a great time, but it's not a place to play and tag. Verse 31, regard not them that have familiar spirits. That's your psych readers and most of your counselors. Neither seek after wizards, be defiled by them. Verse 32, thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God, I am the Lord. That means this, if Brother Lakey walks in, I'm sitting over there and he, I'm sitting over back in one of them chairs and he walks into church. You see that gray head on that man's head? He walks up to me and sticks his head. He walks up, I need to stand. I'm 64 years old. I need to stand and I will. You bet it's Bible. And I'll tell you what, that, that, that junk all starts with kids, you know, just acting like it ain't nothing. No wonder, I'll tell you something I like about the South. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Thank you. Please. Excuse me. You can knock the South off all you want to. Them people got, a lot of them people down there, them old Bible-believing good Christians down there got more sense than the whole rest of the country put together. And there's a reason that New York City and the New York Times and the CNN mocks the Bible belt. And that's why they go fishing and hunting for hypocrite Christians. They'll find one hypocrite Christian and put him on the news to, to smear Christianity. Old brother B.R. Lakin had it right. He said they'll look up in the starry night and there's a million stars that they're holding right in their socket. All of a sudden, here comes a falling star. Ah, look at that falling star. That's the only star they can see in the sky is one that's fallen. Well, verse number 33, and if a sojourner, if a stranger sojourn with you in your land, you should not vex him. Now, hang on to your hat. You're going to start, I, oh, I heard you're going to start milking. You're going to milk 200 cows. And, all right. And you, you, you're going to need to hire four guys. I dare you to find me four white boys in this country that'll put their foot in a pile of cow manure and milk your cows. Man told me out in Idaho. I went out there and he had 20 or 30 Mexicans working big dairy out there. I said, why ain't you got any white boys here? He said, if you can find them, get them, I'll hire them. He said, the only ones I've hired to work for two or three days till they need, till they got enough money to buy their next drug deal. And he said, then they won't show up. He said, if I didn't have these Mexicans milking these cows, they wouldn't get milked and you wouldn't have any ice cream on the shelf. Now, let me tell you something. I'm against illegal immigration probably as much as anybody in this nation. But if we have people come over on green cards to work, God says, don't you oppress them. If we invited them in and said, we need these tomatoes picked, we need these oranges picked, we need these peaches picked, don't oppress them. Treat them good. Now, if they're coming in here illegal crossing the border, and they ain't got a card, working card, 
get out of here. Verse number 34, but a stranger dwell with you and be as one of you that born among you, and you shall love him as thyself. For ye were strangers in the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. Ye shall, watch verse 35, we're getting ready to get done here. Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, in meat yard, in weight and measure. Just balances, just weights, a just ether, a just hen shall ye have, for I am the Lord your God which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Ye shall observe all my statutes and all my judgments and do them. I am the Lord. You know what that means? Get your foot and your thumb off the scale. You're buying logs and you've got a scale stick. You do measure it right. You're selling vegetables by the pound. You make sure your scales is balanced. Don't you like buying tater chips? <laughs> you buy a bag of tater chips. They're all puffed up inside. Open them up. And there's four or five chips down in there. I don't know how many of these, but, you know, but it makes it look like, you know, that, you know what God's saying? He's, and, I, and, God, and by the way, that's why the government has a scales and weights division. They go all over the country, grocery stores, everywhere to make sure that the scales are right because people will cheat. And a lot of money can be made, a lot, sorry money can be made by cheating on scales. Now, I've preached on this before, but I want to tell you, here's the big scales we mess up. Here's the bad one. When your child sinned, oh, that's bad. Heavy on the scales. But when my child sinned, well, we need to be merciful now. Kids will be kids. We're real light on the scale. Now, hang on. Sister so-and-so, her husband left her. She was unmarried for 10 years. She met a guy and she got married. Ain't supposed to remarry. Heavy on the scales! But your son's been watching pornography. Light on the scales. God is so wise, folks. I know I've been kind of aggra- aggravating and just going on goofy. and getting. It's a wonder God don't slap me sideways and tell me to get to the house. But I'm going to tell you, this book is wise. It is right. And a nation that runs its laws by this book will be a blessed blessed nation and here's the secret to this whole thing this morning you and i can't stop what somebody's doing out here but we can leave this church house today and go out and do right and be salt and light to this country and be a blessing to this country and bring glory to our god just by weighing the scales right just by treating the stranger right just by doing right oh bob jones senior used to say go out of this church house today folks and do right let's stand our father we thank you lord jesus for the word of god i pray god today that we'll take these words in a solemn sacred seriousness today that you mean what you say i thank you lord today that our salvation is not dependent upon our perfect obedience of the law i'm glad lord it's not dependent on any of that i'm glad today lord that christ fulfilled the law completely and in christ We're saved in Christ. We have fulfilled the law. We give him glory today, God. I pray, Lord, today that you'd help us to adhere to what we're preaching. Help us, Lord, to delight in the law of the Lord, to realize that you don't give us this to be be heavy to us. You give it to us for our blessing. Lord, it'd be a wonderful thing if everywhere we went in this country, folks would deal justly and pay their bills, and not overcharge and not cheat, not defraud, not lie. Be a wonderful thing, Lord, if nobody tried to steal nobody's spouse. Be a wonderful thing, Lord, if no child was ever abused. Dear God, help us to be the ones that folks can see that there's a different way of living. And we'll thank you for what you do, and I pray it bring glory to your holy name. Forgive me, Lord, for not doing it. Maybe, Lord, but I don't know. It seems like sometimes, Lord, my preaching ain't, Lord, it needs to be. But I pray that you'll forgive me where I failed you, and that, Lord, you'll strike from their minds and remembrance the things that wasn't said in the way it ought to have been said or in an attitude that it ought to have been said. I pray, Lord, they'll leave here today knowing that you love them, that you care about them, that you want your very best in their lives. And we'll thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name.